when you put your whole self into a place and then you go somewhere else, you want that place to be super successful still, right? You know, because we care about it, right? We care about these issues. So that's what I really hope for the organization is it continues to look to find new and creative means to engage the region, tell the story. I think if the organization does that, it will be incredibly successful. Welcome back to DAM, the official podcast of Northwest Hydropower. I'm your host, Austin Rohr, and I manage all things communications here at Northwest River Partners. Change is inevitable, and today we're going to cover some big changes happening right here at Northwest River Partners. Don't worry, because we're still going to probably talk a lot about hydropower, too. We haven't forgotten what DAM is all about, after all. However, before we get started, I strongly encourage you to stick around until the end of the episode as we've also got some important announcements regarding the future of this year podcast as well. I know this all probably sounds really scary right now, but don't worry. This is going to be a fun episode and we have nothing but positivity to spread. And you're maybe wondering how I know that. Uh, for starters, for the third time, I have none other than our very own Kurt Miller here to join in studio and we always have a blast doing these. So before we get into it, I, I also have to share that this episode will officially be our 21st. And according to the data, that means that DAM has crossed the threshold into the 1% of all podcasts. How cool is that? Oh my gosh, can I talk yet? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's amazing. Seriously, you know, and I, I can imagine that you think about uh, like, for instance, restaurants or like nightclubs, right? You hear yeah. that like they're all out of business within a year, right? You know, it's only the only the best can survive, and you have put together the best. So <laughs> I, I mean, it, I, I love the podcast. Thank so you. I'm not Thank at you. all surprised, but that's really cool. It is, and you know, the other thing too that I mean is worth pointing out is like, I think typically podcasts do about one episode a week, and we know that's not sustainable given our workload and the complexity of mm. doing this particular podcast with this subject. So in some ways it's like, you know, we've been around for longer than kind of the 21 weeks, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but we've actually hit the 21st episode. So now it's like an official thing. That's so. amazing. No, I will. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, sincerely, Austin, this was your brainchild. Um, and, uh, and so I, I mean, I've been so excited about what it has become and, uh, and everyone, by the way, who has been on the show? Who because I get I know a lot of them. And they're like, oh, Austin's so good. You know, I mean, I mean that like yeah. you know, fully. Like he made it really easy. He's very professional. You even have your professional radio voice. <laughs> you do, you, you, but you do, you do such a great job. And uh, yeah, I'm not at all surprised uh, that we made that threshold. But it also, uh, and I, I do want people to understand for for those who are tuning in. Gosh, it's a lot of work. You know, um, we don't know exactly when we're going to get guests on sometimes, so the cadence can be really hard. I know that uh, one of the podcasts you were up till after midnight editing because you <laughs> needed to drop it, or I yeah. think it was until midnight because you had until midnight to drop it before yeah. it would come out in the right time. So yeah, there's um, all the behind the scenes stuff that people don't think about. Uh, take, you know, it takes that to make something successful. Definitely, definitely. But we are the official and only Northwest Hydropower podcast as a result. So very, <laughs> very proud of that. And um, I, you know, I appreciate the, th the feedback and uh, I really appreciate everyone that we've had on up mm -hmm. to this point. And, mm -hmm. you know, I look forward to everyone we're going to get to have on yeah. as well. But I, I also do have to thank you as well. Obviously, the support to do this, you know, it's kind of a crazy concept of like, is anyone actually going to listen to this, right? <laughs> and then the other part of it, too, is, you know, so many of the amazing guests that we've mm -hmm. had on, you've been a big part of getting to connect those people to me. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people maybe would have been like, who in the, you know, who in the world and why am I getting a request to be on this? But, you know, having you to kind of back me up and be like, no, this is a really exciting thing we're doing yeah. and we'd really like to have you on, I think has helped get us to that point. And hopefully moving forward, we can continue to get more people on as they mm -hmm. kind of see, you know, who we've had for previous guests right. in that lineup. We've had great people. I yeah. mean, I, um, you know, there's, uh, everyone has been amazing, you know, and a few that do pop out to me when, uh, when I, when I think of, uh, you know, uh, when we had Thomas McAndrew on, mm -hmm. uh, from Enchanted Rock, 
uh, because I'm a kind of a person with a power supply background. Yeah. And so to me, that was just awesome to kind of hear about kind of the power supply side, but also the microgrid stuff. And, and he's been around for a long time in the engineering stuff. So that was really cool. And then um, I know Bryce Yonker from Grid Northwest. Mm -hmm. uh, he, did, he did a really good podcast that w was awesome. Uh, Greg Cullen from Energy Northwest. Uh, and then maybe my personal favorite was Rick Dunn, um, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. uh, when, when he came on and talked about kind of, um, you know, so uh, you talked about kind of resource require or resource adequacy requirements and things like that. And um, but it, it was just such a lesson, like they're all teachers. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what I think that's what I really liked about it is I tune in and I still I have a background, but I still learn things. And so to me, that's what makes it awesome. And, and I know I'm leaving some really great people out, but those are some that just really stuck in my mind. Yeah, they've all really cemented for me having the belief in what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's really, it's like no matter how much we spend the time with this, there's always so much more to learn. Yeah, and yeah. the more perspective I gain from all of these different mm -hmm. avenues and walks of life and you know people that are in some way or another mm -hmm involved with hydropower you just start to understand how not only how complex mm -hmm. it is but also how important hydropower is in mm -hmm. areas that you couldn't even possibly imagine if you you know sat down and try and brainstorm yeah so it, it's really been yeah it's it's like on a personal level mm -hmm. it's been very good for me to gain so much perspective yeah so, yeah you're you know. learning a lot of stuff right yeah, yeah. and I hope, I hope that all the people that are listening are, are learning too you know no, there, there's something about that right? yeah, yeah yeah but um with that being said i guess the the first thing right off the bat is we should probably talk about why you're back on today and, and get into the big news yeah so is that for me is it, is it cute yeah. for me okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so yeah so um as you know, uh, I've been at Northwest River Partners for almost five years, and you've been there for almost the entirety of that almost five years. And um, and by the way, my my lame but running joke is um, uh, I had to hire Austin because I had no one to direct. I was the, I'm the executive <laughs> director, and I had no staff. So like, what is an executive director without? someone to direct, right? Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, Austin has been amazing. Uh, you've been amazing to work with, uh, and I've already expressed that. But um, anyway, yeah, so um, I had an opportunity to uh, apply on a job uh, for the Northwest Public Power Association's executive director role. Um, and North Northwest Public Power Association, it, I would say, you know, it's kind of like a a sister organization or you know whatever uh, they have I think about 155 members uh, across um, um, a majority of the western United States so a little bit bigger footprint uh, including uh, including Alaska and then also British Columbia so that, that's pretty cool and uh, they deliver they deliver a few things one is um, they have a top-notch training education program so um, you know, for a lot of utilities, especially p for public power, a lot of them are smaller utilities. They can't necessarily have their own trainers on mm -hmm. staff, especially for all the things that they need people to do. So in some ways, you could say that these organizations outsource that, that job to NWPPA. And then, but they also do public policy work like River Partners does. Um, they are a pro hydropower organization, which was an absolute requirement for me. <laughs> and uh, but they, but they also are working on other really important issues for utilities in the West. Um, and then they also actually have an excellent communications department, which uh, which you know, uh, you know some of the folks there, and um, and a lot of their communications are really kind of member focused to keep members informed. Um, but, uh, so it's a little bit different than what we, we do, but I think there's a chance for us to, to meld some of that stuff. So I think that we could, you know, I think NWPPA could do some more outward facing things as well if they were appropriately staffed, you know, uh, for that work and, um, and also help lay the groundwork for good public policy. So I think there's some exciting things there, but anyway, um, they hired me. So I, uh, that's, uh, that's the, the, the short version. I went through the whole process. Um, and I will say that just, just so you guys know, um, uh, um, who are listening to the podcast, it was a really hard decision for me. I love what we do at Northwest River Partners. I love who we do it for. You know, we genuinely are out there fighting for communities who depend on hydropower for affordable, reliable, clean energy. 
and you know that is you know it's a staple for life right and and so and you you and I have talked about this you know mm-hmm. driving across the northwest and saying hey this community there are members this community there are members you know and it's like it's like it really makes it real to you that it's like this is you know these are real people real communities that we're we're doing our best to you know speak up for so um, that that was a really hard choice but you know I, I have a chance to do something similar at NWPPA and also to kind of diversify a little bit and um, and I'm excited about that I'm excited to diversify but the but the other really big draw is I didn't have to actually move very far away from you uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Northwest River Partners rent space from NWPPA so they're our landlord <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and uh, so I am literally just moving upstairs uh, so that was another requirement I'm like I'm not taking any jobs where I have to be more than like a hundred feet away from Austin <laughs> <laughs> so I do I did for context we're recording this the day after our annual meeting right and I got two really interesting questions last night mm-hmm. about specifically about you going upstairs uh-huh. uh, number one is how many times do you think you're going to accidentally walk down here because you're just going through the routine no, I think every time I think I, <laughs> I think every time I um I <laughs> I already thought about that. I'm just like, you know, when you've done something so many times, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's going to be hard. Yeah, to uh, have it, right? It's going to be really hard. Yeah, and so the, the, lots of times. The second question that came up was, once you move up there, are you going to raise the rate on us? Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> that, that's, not, that's a foregone conclusion. Uh, the, the, our board already asked me that. I'm like, yes, absolutely. Rent's going <laughs> You can't keep getting away with it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> now, you know, it's so funny, the previous executive director for NWPPA, Scott Corwin, who's a great guy, and he actually went to take maybe the biggest job in public power, mm-hmm. uh, or one of the very biggest, is the head of uh, the American Public Power Association back in Washington, D.C., and that's how um, this opportunity came available. But he had wanted to meet with me a few times to talk about the rents, you know, uh, uh, which I presume meant a rent increase. But he was so busy. <laughs> he was so busy, he never had the chance to do it. So, um, so but yeah, I, uh, uh, I, I do know that you guys are stellar tenants, and that certainly will definitely be part of the consideration. So. Yeah, as long as no one goes spilling anything on the car. <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> you said you were not going to say anything about that. You had promised. <laughs> Um, so I, you know, I think you touched on it a little bit, but, um, as far as kind of what you're looking forward to most with oh. your new role, I mean, are, you know, are there some things that you're particularly excited about kind of going into this? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think one thing, um, and I, and you know this really well, we, um, you know, we have a, um, one thing that's ex- really exciting and maybe, and maybe to start with the, the first most exciting thing is that I get to work on behalf of many of the same communities yeah. right and that's super cool and and I you know after you know being in public power and um, and getting to do that work it's really meaningful work and so to get to do that even on kind of a little bit bigger scale because it the geographic footprints bigger we have more you know a little bit more membership um, that's very cool you know so I'm excited about that um, I'm also excited to um, I'm also excited to diversify my work I said that but uh, you know, I, 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 I think that um, I've poured, I mean, I'm going to say this, you know, I poured my heart and soul into this job and I am, I, you know, I couldn't do that if I didn't really believe in hydropower. Uh, but I do think that it's always good to continue um, to get to have new challenges. And so I will still be working on hydropower, but I'll get to have some new challenges as well. And that's pretty cool. And then the other thing I will say is, um, you know, uh, the the staff there. I think that um, you know I know a few of those folks. They're awesome, and it will be it will be fun to to get to know them and that com- you know the community of, of staff. So I think those are all things that I'm I'm definitely looking forward to, um, and uh, and you know of course there's so much learning to do. Like anytime you start something new. And, and so I'm going to have to do a, a lot, mostly just listening at first, right? You know, I'm, you know I want to I understand how, you know, st- you know, staff and management feel about, you know, things because, um, you know, there's uh, uh, a good team there. And then, you know, how do our board you know, directors feel? How do our members feel? You know, and so 
you know, once I can have enough of those listening sessions, essentially, I think then I'll be able to kind of map out how I think I can help the organization best. Yeah, yeah. No, that definitely makes sense. On the other side of things, are there any things in particular that you think you'll miss about your current role? Oh, Maybe. yeah, absolutely. I was Like I said, it was not a slam dunk for me to even apply on the job, you know. Um, and so, like, um, I've gotten to know, um, as you have, you know, our board really well, you know, the Northwest River Partners Board. And we've developed a real rhythm um, and, and relationship. We have kind of gone through some, you know, some really challenging times policy-wise out there, which has put stress on, but we've come out of that stronger as a organization. And we almost have a shorthand now, you know, that we can speak. And, um, and so I think about, I do, I think about that. It's like, you know, you know, a lot of trust has been built in that space. And, um, and they don't, and that doesn't mean they agree with me on stuff. <laughs> you know, you've been in the meetings, they, they don't always agree uh, with me, but, but I think there's such a mutual respect there. And, and so of course with a new job and, uh, and new board members, it's going to take time to build that trust, right. And to get to know, uh, to get to know each other. So I think that's, um, I think that's going to be, that's going to be, you know, something I'll miss just knowing that I already have that, right? And so I, obviously that, um, I will miss, I, I won't say, I'm, I already said I'm gonna miss working with you, so I'm not gonna add that to it. <laughs> but I will, very, you know, so just so people know, and I, I, I don't know if we've said this before in our podcast, but Austin and I literally sit, I mean, almost side by side. We sit um, like maybe seven feet apart, you know, from each other. And we've been doing that in the same room for, you know, four and a half years. And, um, and we have, you know, just always gotten along. And that can't, I mean, that could go, have gone the other way, you know? <laughs> I mean, and so uh, it is special to have that kind of relationship with somebody where you, you know, um, again, you just, you just, you have, uh, you develop a closeness and, um, and a partnership and, and that is, that isn't also, that's also not easily replaced, right? So I think that's hard. The other thing um, though is, and I, and I don't want to really let this go entirely. Um, I've gotten to form a lot of good relationships in the agricultural community, mm-hmm. you know, and just some of the best people that you'll ever meet, right? And uh, where River Partners has agricultural members, and the BPPA, um, I, and I haven't looked at all of their associate members, but I don't know if they do as much. And so I, I definitely want to maintain those relationships. I would definitely miss that if, um, if, that, went, if, that, if that went away, that would, that would be hard. Um, and you know, one last thing I guess I would just say is, um, and sometimes this is good and sometimes it's bad, but we are very much in the heart of activity here for some, some, especially around the Lower Snake River dams and that, and, and, and that feels really meaningful to me. I think it's a really important, it's a really important issue. And while, you know, that will still be an important issue, you know, for us at NWPPA, I think that um, we'll, we'll probably approach it from a different, you know, different uh, um, purview. That's probably not the right word. I'm going to pretend it's the right <laughs> word, and uh, and so I think that uh, I'll definitely I'll definitely you know miss that as well. So yeah, I mean just uh, you know just oh, there's a lot to miss, but uh, but that's why I feel so blessed in another way, right? Is that the the organizations again do have a lot of the same members, and that's really cool. And so it means it makes it a lot it, it makes it a lot less. Um, Sat, I, sure. Yeah, yeah, you know. So for, for for me, that's that's huge. And I think that kind of tees me up to ask you the next question that mm-hmm. I have. And I'm sure there's a there's probably a podcast answer and a you know at home answer <laughs> to this <laughs> right. one. But are there are there things that you won't miss about being here? Uh, yeah. Um, are there things I won't miss? Um, you know, I I would say that. Northwest River Partners have been a, a really strong advocate for the Lower Snake River dams, and and I'm proud of that. But any issue in society that is that has some controversy around it 
means that you're going to, if you come out strongly on one side or the other, you're going to expose yourself to some harsh feedback, sure. right? Right, and um, and that is part of this. That's been you know that's part of this job, and um, and it's something that, that it's been worth it because we are making a difference and we believe in what we stand for. Uh, but um, on the other hand, it you know that's never fun. Right, um, as, uh, as you know, um, I am not a contentious person. You know, I mean, overall, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's not fair to ask you since you still work for me, <laughs> but I feel like I'm not a contentious person. Um, and and you know, but I think that that, that constant um, and 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 it's not from everyone. We have a lot of support and a lot of supporters. But there are, of course, in every crowd, there's a vocal minority, you know, potentially out there on any side of any issue, right? You know, so I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, but I'm just saying that, you know, you will occasionally get some hate mail or, you know, sure. or, or hate voicemail or, you know, things like that. And, and, um, and you know, I think that uh, I, I won't, uh, that's something I won't miss. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that it's been, you've handled it very well. Uh, You know, some people, I think, could take it very personally, getting some of the emails and phone calls that we have over the years. But, you know, it's, I think no matter how well you take it, it, there's always that piece of it that, like, you're going to feel a little bit of it. It just reminds you of the negativity that can be in the world. Yeah. Um, I think, so, yeah, I don't take it personally. Like, um, for the people out there who, you know, might, you know, kind of go over the top on some of this stuff. I mean, they, generally speaking, they don't know me, you know. Um, right. You know, so I know that it's not personal in that regard, right? They, there's a, there's a kind of a, they see a symbol or something, right? Um, uh, but it can, it does remind you, it's like kind of the stark reminder of the strong negativity that can be out there sometimes. And, and that's, that's less fun. Sure, you know? sure. And I find myself more and more in the past few months, especially, telling people that we really tried in the early, I would say maybe the the first year of being at the organization, Mm -hmm. to work on being more collaborative Mm -hmm. on the issue Mm -hmm. and really break down some of the walls when it comes to the... I mean, ultimately, it's going to be controversial, right? But can we find a way to make it so that it's not so contentious, so it's not such a a hot issue? Mm -hmm. And it just, there wasn't a lot of receptiveness that came out of that of like, oh, yeah, let's do it. You know, it was Mm -hmm. like, okay, I guess if you guys aren't going to come along, like, you know, that is what it is. And uh, we'll we'll keep trying and our our arms are always (laughs) open to it, you know, but... Um, I think that that's something that has been uh, always a, an uphill battle is mm-hmm. trying to find a way to be both, you know, truly about what we believe in, mm-hmm. which includes standing up for the Lower Snake River dams, right. while also recognizing that, like, it just creates this natural rift that we would love to see become, you know, at least a little bit more closed in or you know, go away altogether if it was possible. Yeah, no, that, that's really well said. I, um, Yeah, I think that when we came in, you know, we were fresh to these issues, right? I mean, yeah. both of us. And, and we're trying to figure out where we were on some of them, and we've talked about that a little bit. And, uh, but the um, one of the things I definitely wanted to do when I came in is kind of reach across the aisle, not in a partisan, because it's not Republican, Democrat, but, you know, ac- across the aisle in terms of people who, who wanted to see, and specifically we're talking about the Lower Stink River Dams, right, but who wanted to see the Lower Stink River Dams removed. And, and you know, my thought is, um, you know, we, we, can dis- we can agree to disagree on some things, but still work on collaboratively on others, right? And, and, you know, one place where we've had really good success with that, I would say overall, um, is with um, different tribal entities. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, I think that, uh, it, and, and of course every tribe um, is its own nation and is sovereign and has its own perspectives on things, right? And so, uh, you know, I don't want to 
paint too broad of a brush when I say tribal or tribes, right? I think it's, it's important to understand that they're not monolithic. But, um, but I, I would say that um, with, with some of the tribes and some of the, the groups that represent them, um, we've been able to find some really great common ground, um, even if we agree, even if we disagree, maybe specifically on the Lower Snake River dams. And then there, and there are some tribes that we worked with who their issues aren't at all related to the Lower Snake River dams, right? And so that's actually been even, you know, an easier place to find a common accord, right? Which is really cool. And um, and my in my sense is even even with the tribes who we haven't found that space with because that is like the big issue for for them, um, you know I I you know still have a lot of respect for them, um, you know the place where I think I was more disappointed would be um, with non tribal groups mm-hmm. is that I I, I I it felt like with some of those groups that we would meet with um, that I mean that it was just it was really like, if you're not for me, you're against me. And, um, and that, um, again, that's not universal, but I'm just saying that there was definitely some of that, you know? And so that was, I didn't in necessarily anticipate that. Um, and, and I think that that's, um, uh, that's unfortunate, but you know, I'm, in I'm going to say this and I, I'm not trying to be self-serving here. I, you know, I try to have a short memory about things like that. Um, and I think that, um, you know, is, you know, there, I would certainly be willing to work with any of those organizations on common goals. Right. And I think that that's, I think that that's, um, I think that's really important and, uh, and we'll continue to see, I mean, you know, I think one thing that we have proven over the last and maybe pre- previous to this too, we just weren't here. Right. But mm-hmm. I think one of the things we've proven over the last five years is that, um, we're very much willing to 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 talk to anybody, to um, to to engage in you know meaningful conversations, um, and that we you know actually I mean so we do care about so many of the same issues even with people who disagree with us on certain things you know um, I mean if you were to ask all of the parties involved in the in the debate. You know, do you care about salmon? You know, I think everyone would sincerely say yes. Do you care about uh, vulnerable communities who depend on affordable electricity? Absolutely yes. You know, do you care about healthy agriculture? I mean, you know, absolutely yes. Do you want electricity in your home if it's reliable, even when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining? You know, I'm pretty sure yes. Uh, you know, and, and so there is there is like this hope of commonality, right? You know, um, and, and again, like I said, the place where I feel like we found that the most in terms of people who, um, you know, people think might be opposed to Lower Snake River Dams is, you know, I think we found the most commonality with, um, with um, you know, the tribal community. Um, again, and, and that's not to say that, that it's not universal. Again, not too big, of, not too broad of a brush. But I think that we've made we made progress there, and I'm really proud of that. Um, and um, and but you know I you know candidly I love all our partners. I mean when we think about you know the people we work with, and I in in us in the public power space, we love public power people. I mean like they're awesome. Seriously, like you, oh, yeah. I mean, and again uh, you know there's there's exceptions to every rule, but. Overall, it's such a great community because it's people who really are there to help their communities, right? Well, you know, you could say the very same thing about the tribes, right? Uh, and you could say the very same thing about the farmers and the agriculture, right? I mean, we work with like genuine, like, you know, what people would refer to as like salt of the earth kind of people. And, um, and that is super special. Not everybody gets to do that. And um, so, yeah, that's something I definitely don't want to leave behind. You asked like what I might miss. I'm like, I don't want to leave that behind, you know, you know, with some of those groups that we've made ground, you know, um, we've made strides with. You know, one of the things that really stands out as you're describing some of these different things is that a lot of, I think, both of our experiences over these past few years has come from the fact that, you know, Yes, there is the work. There's mm-hmm. the organization. There's the job that we're expected to do. Mm-hmm. 
but at the same time, there, there's a really important component of who we are as people. Mm-hmm. And I think that whether it's the enjoyment of getting to work with all kinds of people and, you know, engage and socialize, mm-hmm. or whether it's like you said, you know, just being non-contentious in nature, mm-hmm. you bring that to the table when it comes to, you know, trying to work with these different groups mm-hmm. or, or trying to find common ground. I think that a lot of that has been sort of baked into almost our identity as an organization for these last few years mm-hmm. that a lot of that has been just coming out of, I think, the type of people that, that we are. Right, and right. that's not to say, like, oh, we're these amazing yeah. people. We're so I much, mean, we are amazing. You know? <laughs> no, I mean, but I think coincidentally, no, no, I agree with you. I yeah. think that, I mean, um, one thing that um, I, I do think that we both value relationships, right? And I think, um, and, and neither one of us is looking for fights, you know? Right. And so that doesn't make us amazing, but it, you know, um, I think that's a culture we have in our small, in our very small room, <laughs> which I think is really funny. I'm sorry. It's just like, it is funny. But um, uh, by the way, for those of you who, um, and obviously you're, we're not on video, but the office is actually not that small, but it's just kind of parsed out, you know, with these kind of faux right. walls. And so Austin and I had to decide whether we wanted to sit next to each other in one room or... Uh, and then when the other room's a conference room, do we want a conference room, which is now the podcast room? So anyway, anyway that's how it all it just all worked out. So we have like a kind of a pseudo lobby, then us in one room, and then the the podcast room. Um, but anyway, um, it works out. It, I think it's worked out well. But anyway, going back just going yeah. back to the thing, not um, yeah. I think that um, being people who do care about relationships, I think that's. It's really, it's really helped. And by the way, one of the groups I, I, I left out in terms of you know people we get to work with, uh, we've been get, getting to work with unions a lot more now. Mm-hmm. And again, just people who care about community, hard workers, uh, and um, and like I mean at Riverfest, right? You know, um, uh, uh, you know Christine Reed, who's one of our board members uh, from IBW Local Seventy Seven. She's like, do you guys need help at Riverfest? And it, it so turned out that I was going to a different event that day for one of our members. And so I'm like, yeah, we could help. We could use help at Riverfest. And she's like, well, hey, we've got a couple of, you know, IBW folks who would be happy to staff the booth with Austin. And I was just like, that's awesome, right? Oh, yeah. You know, uh, and what's great, you know, about, you know, uh, about them is just, you know, again, just willingness to roll up the sleeves. But also, um, you know, just... Uh, you know, really good people and great, um, and just great caring. And I think that's what makes this whole community so special. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, you know, I got to give a shout out to those guys, especially cause I, I think I shared with you, I kind of like tweaked my back the night oh, before. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Right. Right. So I was in like pretty good pain mm-hmm. on Saturday, but the show must like, I must go on. Riverfest right? isn't stopping for me. You know? <laughs> so, and especially being, you know, that mm-hmm. I, I was, the the lone man to kind of right. get everything going it's mm-hmm. like i can't i can't back out like i right. can't not have a booth right, so right, right. Uh, having them there was so tremendously helpful for me and then i did also feel bad because uh you know one of the two guys had um had soldier uh shoulder surgery uh-huh. recently try saying that three times yeah. <laughs> and um <laughs> and he actually ended up kind of getting stuck doing a lot of the cornhole oh, like no. it just it was the way the dynamic kind right, of flowed right. throughout the day where like you know, based on where people were at and who was kind of talking to who mm-hmm. and everything, you know, the kids just kept coming up. They wanted to play cornhole, and so he's, like, down there with one arm picking up the bean bags. So we just had this kind of, you know, two out of three of us were injured in right. some way, but we all made it work, and it, we had a great time. So, That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, you know, so appreciative for, for all of our members and, yeah, really happy that they've volunteered their support for things like that. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's really fun. Very cool. Uh you know, kind of moving on from there, do you feel like you have maybe some specific lessons that you've learned during these last few years so that you could share about, you know, leading this organization mm. and, and takeaways that you've had as a result of that? Yeah, that, that's such a good question. Um, I, you know, I, I shared with you just offline earlier. It's like sometimes I, I don't, um, I generally don't speak before I think, but I will speak before it's fully baked sometimes. <laughs> and, and it's such a thoughtful question. I, I, I'd love to give it, you know, some, some more consideration. Um, 
I, you know, I have learned lots of lessons, right? You know, I mean, I think that um, a lot of those lessons are just observing people mm -hmm. and um, and just seeing, you know, how how much um, people, you know, people who are offering help, how important that is, you know, or or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that I think that those are some things. But if I was gonna if I was gonna highlight it, I would say. Um, that you know this has been the most meaningful job of my life and the reason it's been meaningful is because it's an opportunity to help communities right it's an opportunity to help people um, make sure they have access to um you know uh, to something they really need yeah yeah you know which is you know again it's clean affordable reliable electricity which is provided by hydropower right that's i mean that's really cool and so every day I feel really motivated. I feel motivated by those, you know, for serving those communities, but I feel really motivated by the, by like the utilities, um, you know, their leadership and the members that we get to interact with. They're awesome, right? I mean, there's really good people. And so it's just like, you know, I guess I've, I've learned that, that, you know, getting to work for good people, for a good cause, it's like, it's, it's really special. I don't take that for granted. Um, and, I know, you know, and, and, you know, I worked previously for an investor owned utility and I, I think that they probably feel the same way. I just, I think I feel a closer connection to that, um, in the kind of advocacy work we do. And, uh, and so anyway, I think that's, I think that's one thing. Um, the other thing I think is, um, you know, I've learned things about myself, right. You know, right. um, uh, but I, 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 one thing I would definitely say is, um, for us who are hydropower advocates is that there are folks who would rather we not, we rather we not tell our story. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, and they can kind of browbeat you a little bit, you know, on, on that and, you know, kind of frown upon it. Uh, but we have such an important story to tell, like electricity impacts so many different areas of life and, uh, and society. And, you know, um, you, you know, I learned more about it on one of your podcasts, as a matter of fact, you know, when we think about, okay, yeah, not only do we need um, the Lower Snake River dams for the irrigation that they provide in terms of the water, but then it takes a lot of electricity to pump water out of those reservoirs. And that's not just in eastern Washington, it's wherever you have irrigated crops, right? So farmers rely on affordable electricity maybe more than almost anybody, right? Yeah. I mean... Uh, that's really huge for them. And so you think about like, you know, you think about that connection and you think about in terms of, you know, climate change concerns and and um, and how important, you know, hydropower is if we're actually, you know, if people actually want to achieve these clean energy mandates, you cannot do it without hydropower. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that is absolutely, you know, that is absolutely a fact, you know, for this region, you know, about, um, half of our total electricity comes from hydropower. And even with us, where we have a very high penetration of renewables because of hydropower, um, it's still going to be incredibly challenging to get the grid fully decarbonized by 2040 or 2045 or 2050, right? I mean, it's going to be. It, we're going to essentially have to have more than double the total generation that's already online. Um, so to think that you can get rid of productive hydropower resources and still meet those mandates, it's it's not going to happen, right? And so from my perspective, it's it's one of those things where it's like, okay, yeah, so hydropower is immensely important to trying to achieve these mandates. Um, and I think that if you're if you believe that climate change is the threat that you know many scientists believe it is you have to support hydropower you know um so i think you know so you've got that um and even and then there's other things i mean in terms of like you know um other emissions uh not just co2 but if you think about um um you know the emissions that come from coal plants um and, and to a lesser extent from natural gas plants you know much greater extent from coal but you know that can really harm you know harm the health of people, right? You know, that's not something that you get from hydropower. And uh, so there's just so many different ways in which 
um, electricity and how it's produced impacts, you know, the whole whole of society. And so I think that we need to tell that story. And as you know, I've traveled along around telling that story a lot, you know, <laughs> um, and, and, and not only just through our ad campaigns, which you've managed, which you've done an ama- amazing job at, but, you know, just kind of in small community groups and in, you know, city clubs and all those things. And it's interesting, people get it once they see it, right? Yeah. You know, and so I would say, you don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't tell your story. So that's the lesson, right? That was a mm-hmm. long, I know it was a long winding road <laughs> to get to get to the lesson. But the lesson is that um, that we have to tell our story because mm-hmm. if you don't tell your story, that void will be filled, right? And so I, I really, I, I really wish, you know, there's some hundred power supporters out there who are more quiet on some of these issues because sure. you know they don't want to be controversial or you know, things like that, uh, or perceived as controversial, right? And, but everyone who believes in the resource but doesn't tell the story um, is leaving a void, and that void will be filled and in, in ways that probably aren't helpful to the, sure. you know, to, to, to the communities that they serve. So I think that's probably the biggest lesson I've learned um, in terms of, of the work um, and there, there are probably a, a dozen others as well, but I think that that's, that's one that really is standing out to me today. Mm-hmm. What do you hope to see from the organization after you've transitioned out? Okay. That is a great question. Um, I really believe in Northwest River Partners. Um, you know, the, um, when you put your whole self into a place and then you go somewhere else, you want that place to be super successful still, right? You know, because we care about it, right? We care about these issues. Um, so what do I want to see? I think that um, I want to see members to continue to support the organization. I think, and I think they will. You know, we just had our member meeting last night, as you mentioned, and I think there was a lot of enthusiasm in the room. Definitely. And um, and hopefully that's not because I'm leaving. <laughs> but, but, you know, it was, there. you know, I think people get it, you know. Like, yeah. you know, people get it. It's like, yeah, we have mapped out a course where we will get that story told. And so I think, you know, and, I, and whoever the next executive director is, I, I certainly want them to have the the freedom to put their own stamp on the on the strategy of the organization I think it's really important uh, but I think that we have uh, you know identified a good path to success and mostly in Austin mostly it is and, and, and if anyone wants to know what the secret is right the secret is just getting the word out I mean it really yeah. is it's just, it's a simple you know our data always shows you know, because we do polling all the time, you know, it always shows that the more people know about hydropower, and I'm talking the whole picture of hydropower, you know, I'm talking all sides of the, the story. The good, but, the bad. Right, 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 right. But the more people know about it, the more that they support it. So for us, the magic is just making sure that people hear it. And uh, and and so again, we, we, you know, if we don't, if we don't tell the story, the void will get filled in other ways. We have to tell the story. So that's what I really hope for the organization is it continues to look to find new and creative means to engage the region and tell the story. And I think if I think if the organization does that, it will be incredibly successful. You did mention it, so so I have to ask. Yeah. Uh, should the supportive listeners of this podcast, and to some extent myself, have any reason to worry about who will lead River Partners next? Well, so um, I'm really excited, uh, and of course you know this, um, is that we got an amazing interim executive director in Heather Stebbings. Uh, Heather Stebbings was the head of the Pacific Northwest Waterways Association, and she worked in that organization previously. Um, I think that she may have spent, I don't know if it's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say like 13 years of total or something like that at, at that organization. And essentially, they're, again, another sister organization, uh, um, and they mostly um, represent uh, kind of ports and, and, um, and barging companies and some agriculture and things like that. But um, she really gets the river system issues, 
in a way that like um, that just someone who wasn't working on kind of the front lines of these issues just couldn't get in a short period of time. Yeah. And so her coming in, it will be for the most important issues facing us over the next few months, it will be very seamless. And uh, and I and I do I I said this last night, but I feel so much less guilty <laughs> about leaving uh, because I know that she'll come in and just do an amazing job. And she's not interested in doing the job full time or or you know or permanently. Um, uh, but uh, but she will be an amazing uh, interim yeah. and uh, and give us time, give you know us time. When I say us, but you know give the board um, and the organization time to find just that right person to fill in on a you know permanent basis. I say permanent. Uh, that that sounds uh, n- n- no one has to do any job forever, but you know uh, we'll we'll just use that as shorthand. Yeah, I mean, all joking aside, I think we're definitely in good hands here, and, and the organization's in good hands. So whether it's me or the people that really enjoy listening to this podcast and don't want it to go away, right. I think we're all going to be <laughs> no, okay. No, we're good. I mean, you know, one of the things, um, um, you know, and you and I obviously have developed a, you know, a, a, a very close working relationship and friendship, and when, it, you know, and of course... You know, when your boss in a in a group of two people, <laughs> you know, announces that he's going to go do something else or she's going to go do something else, right? Um, uh, the uh, you know, you're kind of like, well, I wonder what that means for me. <laughs> and you know, the very first thing I said to you is, you know, there was a strong organization here before we got here. Um, you know, before I got here, and and it's gonna, and I think it's even stronger now that you know, um, after these five years later. And so, um, and we have a very committed membership. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I expect, the truth is there is a need for the work that Northwest River Partners does. Yeah. And when there's a need, there will be an organization, right? And so that's the way I look at it. I'm, I'm, I, I have the utmost confidence in that. And again, you were at the meeting last night. I, I, I'm sure you have no doubt uh, at this stage. You know? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. If you were to take a step back five years ago, and I think we did touch on this a little bit towards the beginning of this episode as well. Mm-hmm. We were both very fresh, I feel like, mm-hmm. coming into sort of the hydropower specific space. Mm-hmm. You know, we both had some experience coming into it with energy, utilities, things like that, but mm-hmm. really getting up to speed on. And motocross, don't forget motocross. And, and motocross. <laughs> uh, but getting up to speed on the actual, you know, really nitty gritty details Mm -hmm. with the hydro system Mm -hmm. was something that we both took considerable time doing Mm -hmm. and did a lot of research. Right. Now that we're five years into this, Mm -hmm. how do you feel that your time in this role has shaped and really changed your understanding of hydropower? Mm, That's a really great, that's a really great question. Um, So I started my career at the Bonneville Power Administration um, and they are very big in the hydro space, right? Uh, right? And then I worked uh, for investor-owned utility for 20 years, and um, and uh, that utility had uh, hydropower resources, and I and I worked in the power supply area for most of that 20 years. Mm-hmm. So, like, I had a sense of hydropower, right? You know, I really did, um, and that's one of the reasons I applied for the job. It's like, you know, when I was seeing all the wind and solar being built, and I understood that those resources, while great, needed some sort of carbon-free glue, essentially, to hold the whole thing together. You mm-hmm. have to have on-demand generation because wind and solar are intermittent. They're not always available. And so I'm in, at, at our, when I was at, you know, when I was at Portland General, where I worked, um, I saw on the real-time desk how much they depended on the hydropower to actually make it all work. Mm-hmm. And so from, from my perspective, I was like, gosh, this is a really, really important resource for this region, especially the more we decarbonize, the more important hydropower is going to be because you're not going to have natural gas and coal fire generation to fill that role. Now it's just going to be hydropower and, and hopefully more nuclear, you know, or something, right? Uh, but, you, but you need something. And so I'm like, yeah, no, I'm, this, is worth, this is worth advocating for. Um, and, but I think the thing I didn't understand because I hadn't looked at, um, all the numbers is for instance, in Washington state where you and I both live, um, I think it's almost 40% of the population requires some sort of government assistance to make ends meet. And you just like, 
oh my gracious, you know. And, um, and that's in a state where we have, just recently we came out ranked with the lowest electricity prices in the nation, you know. And of course that's because we have hydropower, right? But still, you know, uh, when we look at, you know, some of those efforts to try to get rid of the, you know, let's say the Lower Snake River Dams or other productive hydroelectric projects, um, which would mean literally billions of dollars more cost placed on the region. Um, and you think about those communities that would suffer. Um, I mean, it, it, I just, I, I don't think I realized the impact on lives. You know, I, I really approached it from more like a power supply perspective. It's almost more mm -hmm. math to me, right? You know, and, but now, you know, uh, having traveled thousands of miles, a lot by car, you know, you know, yeah. around the region, and seeing the, you know some of the challenges that people are facing, it's like, oh no, you know what? This is this is uh, as much more than a math equation, right? You know, and and so, uh, by the way, I think that I, I think it's a really interesting point. Um, so one of the things that actually um, what, uh, the National Academy that I wanted to mention, National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and I believe it was in twenty twenty one. Um, they came out with a study about what it would take to decarbonize, I think, the, the U.S. economy by 2050. And, um, and they kind of laid out this roadmap. But one of the things they said, and I think is really important um, for people who do want to decarbonize, right, um, which is a lot of people, is that the greatest risk to decarbonization policy is actually the risk of leaving vulnerable communities behind. Mm. And basically what they were saying is, if you make this electricity tran transition, this clean energy transition, too expensive for people, if you price them out, they will not stand for it, right? You know, and and so that everything will get thrown out. Like, you know, the, the baby and the bathwater, right? You know, yeah. will absolutely all get thrown out. And so one of the things they actually urged is like, to, um, and this is actually a matter of fact, they said, you know, they urged, it's like, we need to keep our existing hydropower and our existing nuclear projects because they are, you know, once now that they're already built in general, you know, they're very cost effective, you know, and, um, and as we, as we know about hydropower, existing hydropower resources are, you know, you know, they last for decades, they can be upgraded. Uh, and the overall cost is very low. So we have these low electricity rates compared to most of the nation. And, um, and so anyway, the, the, the point being that um, I think that we have, to, we have to make sure these communities are considered when we're making these choices. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, and again, I don't mean this disrespectfully to, to groups that let's say would advocate for you know productive dam removal and I'm not in, in, in another aside I'm doing like a second aside within an aside but the, <laughs> the second aside is that Northwest River Partners and, and, and I myself personally we do not support hydropower projects that don't provide value to society mm -hmm. it's like if they're not providing value because they do ecological you know damage right you know right. I mean, it, it changes an ecosystem so it has that you have to get benefit from it for society or there's no reason to continue to operate, right? Yeah. And so, you know, in the you know, the case where you have like old dams that don't produce very much electricity and have no fish passage, it's like Northwest River Partners isn't trying to keep those dams, you know, going. Like the Elwha River dams, right? No fish passage. I, I think no electricity or very little, you know, I mean, those dams should have gone and they did, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that those are success stories as well. Uh, but for the dams like the Lower Snake River dams, which are some of the least cost dams in the entire, you know, Northwest system that have excellent fish passage and provide, you know, um, uh, electricity enough for, you know, at times millions of people. Um, it's like, you're just like, those dams have to stay, right? Yeah. And so, you know, kind of, you know, kind of then weaving that back. I just think that um, when I when I look at this, I think that that's what's so important is people have to understand we have to we have to look at you know this whole thing holistically, and so that that's the part that I think gets that gets missed when people are very myopically focused 
on, let's say, the lower snake river dams in salmon. And salmon are important, and they are mm-hmm. sacred. And and I think that I think we need to look to do things for them. But I think if you're only looking at salmon, and mm-hmm. you guys can't see me, but I have like a, a, a fake micro, a fake like microscope or telescope up, and I'm like you're only looking at salmon, um, and you're not thinking about this broader sociological impacts of all the different things that would be impacted, um, you know then I think that you're missing the picture of, and, uh, and even for fighting climate change, right? Climate change is mm-hmm. the enemy of salmon. And, and if you get rid of some of your most valuable climate fighting generation, um, long run, that's not, that's not good for salmon either, right? So I think if you look at everything from this bigger picture, it's very hard to justify getting rid of these resources that, are so, that so many are dependent on. Your, your myopic example, I, I think, is really interesting because whether it's, like you said, the, the salmon component, the climate change component, or you know even you brought up the math equation, mm-hmm. I think those are all really important things to consider when you're looking into your own heart and sort of wondering you know where you stand on the hydropower issue or, mm-hmm. or where you stand on the lower Snake River dams. Mm-hmm. And I, I think even when you look at, say you know, some of the groups that would like to see the dams taken out, Mm -hmm. you know, are you looking at it from the perspective of, you know, fighting against the structure, you know, the physical, Mm -hmm. like I'm going up against that big hunk of concrete in the river and I want to see that thing come down. Mm -hmm. Or are you thinking about, you know, the, the people that are depending on the energy that's Mm -hmm. producing. Mm -hmm. And I think so many people are focused on that, whatever that myopic thing is right i think they're focused mostly on that more often than not and so even and it, that goes even for us being supportive of hydropower right, right, Again, right. going back to your math equation mm-hmm. example so i really uh, appreciate the perspective that you're sharing on that because i i think that sometimes you say holistic and i don't mean you i mean you yeah know, pe- people say mm-hmm. holistic and it's like oh okay yeah we're looking at the the big picture we're gonna look at salmon climate um, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. but it's, you know, the people that are depending on that energy mm-hmm. are probably, I would say the majority of what makes up that holistic picture, you know, it's, that's like whatever's under that umbrella, mm-hmm. that space is mostly occupied by the people that are depending on it, that energy and the cost of that energy and the benefits that it provides. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, I mean, I think it's, I think it's really well said. I mean, literally millions of Northwesterners, literally millions yeah. are dependent on and would be impacted by the loss of the Lower Snake River dams. Uh, now, the, you know, that doesn't mean, and again, I, I think I, I really want to stress this, you know, I've gotten to meet with tribal members from all across the region and I genuinely I genuinely have learned so much from those interactions and mm-hmm. and so you know that you know the perspective of um, a lot of, you know you'll hear a lot of the uh, tribes say that we are salmon people and 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 they and they are as sincere in that as anyone could be in anything right and you think about salmon being uh, the heart of kind of their traditional economy, the most important staple of their food security, um, the heart of or the center of their um, spiritual beliefs in many cases, right? And so that does deserve to be protected. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I think where we can get at odds with, you know, folks is not on any of those ideas right Right, right. and i is we embrace that i think that the question is um i think the question is you know for dams that were built with fish passage right um so not like grand coulee dam which absolutely blocked passage to fish and and now which i'm really excited about we're going to start studying you know and river partners supported this that you cut the united upper columbia united tribes uh, proposal to study reintroduction of salmon above all those areas. I think it's so exciting. Yeah. You know, uh, I think it's great for the region. And there is no question that those dams are the reason why there aren't salmon above there. And there's an o- amazing opportunity for us to correct that. Right. So I think that's, I think that's awesome. 
But you know, for your, when, when we're talking about the Lower Snake River dams or dams that have excellent fish passage, um, they are not the reason why there are not more salmon in the river. And, and by that, but by that I mean I can I can give an example is what we've heard uh, from tribes, and of course they're, they're not official records, but you know, kind of trying to go back and uh, anticipate uh, how many salmon used to come to the Columbia River Basin. And it's estimated, I think, somewhere between six and 16 million salmon used to return to the basin every year. And, uh, and so, uh, so many times we've heard um, this quote, uh, before the dams were built, 16 million salmon used to return to the Columbia River Basin. And that is almost true. And why that I, don't, why that I mean is there may have been 16 million salmon and it may have been before the dams were built, but they don't say, you know, these groups that, that use that quote don't actually say how long before the dams were built, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, the federal government estimates that between 19, I think between 1915 and 1938, when the first federal dam was built on the Columbia River, that about a million salmon returned to the river each year <laughs> during that period. Um, and, um, and, what really happened was in the late 1800s, European settlers came out and they, and tragically, and of course they had a different worldview, but they tragically absolutely fished out the river. You know, you hear about these giant fish wheels, so they're essentially almost like vacuums just sucking out, you know, one species after another to the point where, um, you know, I think that the first fish hatcheries were built like in the 1880s or something like that. Yeah. You yeah. know, and they build fish hatcheries when there are not enough fish. So they essentially, you know, displaced salmon in the ecosystem, you know, both in the ocean and the river. And, um, and, and so we've seen this period where, you know, uh, we actually have more salmon returning now than on a decade by decade basis. We've seen an upward trend from, from when Bonneville Dam was built. The point I, the reason I bring that example up is if the dams aren't the reason that salmon got reduced, getting rid of them is probably unlikely to be the cause of salmon going back to historical numbers, right? Um, and so I think that's a, I think that's, I think that's something that, you know, when some groups say, oh, well, yeah, we have to get rid of the dams because of the salmon, you do have to look at this, you know, at the historical, it's like, you know, the, the dams did not, you know, at least, you know, the lower Columbia dams, lower Snake River dams, they did not drive down those salmon numbers, right? Um, it, you know, what really drove those salmon numbers down was, it was happened far before those dams were ever built. So I think that, you know, understanding that and then thinking about, okay, what are things we can do given that context, right? Yeah. So it's not that we, oh, it's not like we're like, oh, okay, well, the salmon got hammered, you know, you know, over a century ago, and so, oh, well, now it's not like that, right? You know, I think that, I think that we all want to see salmon return to this region in, in much closer to historical numbers. But the question is, how do we do that? So that's the, that's the point of contention, right? Yeah. Uh, the, you know, and I think that, and I think from the one camp, and I think they're very sincere, it's like, well, we have to do everything we can for salmon. And so that means taking a shot at some of these things, right? Let's, it may be a long shot, but let's give it a go, right? And my point to them is, like, you know, so that, like, say, well, okay, so let's get rid of the dams, and maybe that will help, right? But my point to them is that's not a costless experiment. It's, it's, it's an experiment that we know will have really meaningful damage to the communities that, that we represent. And so you, you can't just take a flyer on something that's that big. Um, but I think that there are things that we can do um, in terms of helping salmon, um, both in the estuary and do more research in the ocean and see what's going on there, um, managing predators. I mean, there's so many things that I think we can do that, that will help, potentially help salmon, may help them a lot, and still leave our critical infrastructure in place. So it's never for us been a debate about dams versus salmon. And I think I really, if I, if I could emphasize any one thing, it would be that. Like, that's yeah. not how we see it. We see, uh, but we do, but we definitely believe, we believe in the importance of salmon and we believe in the importance of hydropower in the region, right? And we don't see those two things as conflicting. 
I know, I, I know a lot of people, well, I actually mean maybe a lot of people is not a, the right word. I know that a vocal minority of people really would disagree with that. But if you actually look, because we've polled the region, right? The majority of people don't think that. They don't mm. think it's hydropower or salmon. They think that, they think that both works. And, and I think that we, we would agree with that. It could be just the osmosis of us sharing the same office space for all these years, but I, I couldn't agree with you more. Oh, good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You've been indoctrinated then, so outstanding. So that leads me right to where I was going to go next. So I, I have to ask, do you think you'll ever be able to deprogram yourself a little bit? Like, in other words... Right. When dams or salmon are going to get mentioned, are you going to feel the hair on the back of your neck still stand up? <laughs> right. That's so funny. I mean, I think that my, you know, I didn't, as you mentioned, when you and I started, we really did a lot of research to form an educated opinion. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that uh, our board knows and, and some members know, we actually pulled down everything from the website that, you know, that we couldn't find documentation for. Yeah. You know, because as an advocacy group, um, we, you know, our credibility is based on stuff that we can prove, right? And so one of the very first things, and it didn't mean the things on the website weren't accurate, but it's just like if we couldn't find it, a way, you know, um, if we couldn't find proof, we pulled it down. And, um, and we've spent so much time researching the issue. And, um, and the more I've researched it, the more convinced I am that... It, that hydropower is critical and the lower stinker river dam should remain. So I um, I am fully willing to engage in that discussion, mm -hmm. e even in a new role. And uh, and uh, at the, you know at the same time, um, I am hoping that in my new capacity, maybe not you know maybe not as the standard bearer for the lower Snake River dams, <laughs> right? Um, that maybe we can have even, you know, some more productive conversations mm -hmm. because, you know, right now in, in many ways, um, North River Partners is the voice of um, the communities that would be affected by losing the lower Snake River dams. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we've had a lot of members say that to us, like, you know, and, and that's not, not to uh, um, say that other groups that are doing that work aren't doing great work. But I, it, you know, I think that we're certainly front and center. I mean, that's almost right. our expectation, right? You right. Know, yeah. as, a, as an organization, we're supposed to represent those people's right. interests. Exactly. Which, right now, that's that's the big thing. So. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> so, so from my perspective, we, um, you know, we are the standard bearer in many ways, right? Um, you know, perhaps in in my new role, um, that there will be less pressure for organizations that maybe don't agree with on every issue that we can have maybe more meaningful discussions, right? And um, because we're, we're, you know, it's, a, it's just a different space. It might be a safer space, you know, uh, and, um, and I'm always willing to learn. I mean, I promise you, like, I read every study I can find. Um, you know, we talk to scientists, we uh, talk to biologists, we, uh, talk to power supply people. Things are always changing, right? So uh, you know, I um, but yeah, I, I I do look forward to not necessarily um, having to be the the debate partner for you know <laughs> you know on some of those right. things because uh, you know you know this Austin, but um, you know I'm very often called upon to be on panels to debate the issue or even just truly like. Not even a panel, but like one-on-one -on -one debates. Yeah. Uh, and, and actually, usually it's more like three-on-one. You know, that's how you know that's how a lot of times these panels are are situated. Where you know it's like uh, even though we represent in a lot of ways the majority view, um, when it comes to representation on panels, <laughs> we're you know they kind of throw one of us in as uh, as, as kind of a minority view. And so uh, you know, I look forward to. I mean. Again, I'm not someone who is looking to mix it up with people. I really do like people. I like to, so I'm 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 hoping that the new in the new position offers me more of an opportunity to um, to collaborate with people, but still stand up for what we. I mean, we have to stand up for what we believe in, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly important, and and I think that we can, and and I think we can't back down from that, but we can certainly have. It, you know, we can have informed 
positive discussions. And, and that's where I would really like to go. Yeah. When we speak about the membership that we represent mm -hmm. as an organization, out of all of our members, who's your favorite? No, I'm now, kidding, kidding. Vigilante power. <laughs> uh, I, we, I said that on the last, on the, on yeah. the podcast with Tom, Thomas. I love that name. It's yeah. the best, it is the, it has got to be the best name for utility anywhere in the nation. Yeah. Uh, but no, what we were really good yeah, at. You don't, yeah, you don't, have to, you don't have to pick a favorite child out <laughs> right, right, of right, exactly. the hundred that we have. Uh, but seriously, maybe out of, uh, you know, when you look at our membership and, and also to just the opportunities you've had as well to go mm -hmm. and speak at different places and, mm -hmm. and be on panels and things. Were there some that stuck out as maybe your favorite places you have to travel to? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so this is really funny. Um, I, at first, you know, I hadn't spent, uh, you know, I grew up in the Northwest, but I hadn't mm -hmm. spent much time in the Tri-Cities. And, um, and when I used to go out there, you know, especially as a kid, like, you're like, well, there's not much out here, right? You know, so, uh, but I've grown to love the Tri-Cities, you know. Now, of course, it's, you know, I'm not a kid anymore. It's changed. Uh, there's more stuff. There's a lot, a lot of activity there, actually. But, uh, but I also think that there's been so much appreciation out of that community for the work that we do um, that you just, you feel... A strong connection mm -hmm. uh, um, and so I think that I, I've definitely that's been um, that's been a really um, that's been a place where my heart has changed how I feel about that place in a in a very positive way and um, so I think that that's I think that's great um, I, I will say I, overall um, just pivoting slightly I do like being on policy panels I think it's really mm -hmm. cool um, and, and I usually learn something in, um, and I think that there's a great opportunity. So I, you know, that's something I do want to continue to do in, in the, in the new gig. And, um, I'm excited about that too. Definitely. And I'm sure, uh, Rick Dunn will be really excited to hear you, <laughs> you call out the Tri-City. Yeah, yourself. absolutely. Okay, now right. Rick, uh, Rick, um, uh, from Benton PUD is, uh, we have a rivalry in terms of who can fit the most slides into a 15 minute presentation. <laughs> and uh, by the way, he totally blows me away. Like uh, he's got like three slides for every one of my slides. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but he does tease me about that. Uh, that's, a, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, kind of going along those same lines. Do you have a particular favorite memory or story that you could share from the past four and a half years? Like any kind of standout moment where you're mm -hmm. like, I, I, that's just, one of those things that was kind of a, a highlight that I have to call out, or even if it's a funny one, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, so um, rescuing you from poverty was <laughs> my, I think, the, the best thing I ever did. Austin was uh, living uh, in San Diego, uh, making below minimum wage. Just a starving uh, man. Yeah, you know, exactly. <laughs> doing motocross. And, um, and, uh, I, uh, I, I, I rescued, I rescued him out of that life. Uh, now it might not be, uh, as glamorous at all, as at all times as motocross, but I feel, I feel like that was my good deed for the day. No, I, I totally tease you. And I, uh, uh, you have been a real blessing. Um, no, uh, you know, I think that, I think I, I will say that in 2022, when Senator Murray and Governor Inslee came out and said that um, they were going to look at whether or not they thought it was a good idea to breach the lower Snake River dams. I think they actually did that in October of 2021, but they were going to use the first six months or seven months of 2022 to, to make that decision. Um, we saw that as kind of a red alert moment, you know, where, um, especially for, for Senator Murray, being a, a very senior senator, um, the most senior senator in the Northwest and one of the most senior senators in, in, in Congress. Uh, and the Lower Snake River dams are federally authorized dams. So if, if she was to come out and say these dams need to go, um, that certainly would be a scary precursor, you know, to, um, to what could lie ahead. And so we went to our members and we asked them for funding for a campaign <clears throat> it was not aimed at Senator Murray or Governor Inslee, but was aimed at raising awareness. We did not want that decision being made, you know, 
I would say, I guess, kind of quietly behind the scenes because, again, we've talked about it so many times, it just it will affect so many people. And, um, and as part of that, um, you know, we, we certainly did a lot of, you know, messaging and things like that. But beyond that, we did, um, we did a, uh, we commissioned a study. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, and you've, uh, you, you've, you've had folks on there, uh, but, um, but Energy GPS did a study for us to look at what it would take to replace the Lower Snake River dams in the context of existing clean energy laws, right? So there have been people who had looked, or groups that have looked at replacing the dams before, but they'd always assume that you could rely on natural gas to essentially provide the needed generation at, at critical moments. And we're like, <clears throat> that's no longer the case in Oregon and Washington, right? And, um, you know, that those the laws that have passed mean that, you know, by 2040 or 2045, respectively, um, you're not going to be able to rely on those resources. So what does it look like just to rely on solar, wind, and batteries, basically, to, to achieve those goals? And one of the things that they found, which I, I thought was fascinating, was first what they did is they said, okay, let's look at what it would take to actually get to those clean energy goals with the dams in place. And so what they did, they looked at that, that timeline and they, um, and they said, okay, we're going to have to build essentially, again, I mentioned over double the existing amount of generation that we have on the grid right now in 20 years to make that timeline. And then and the thing that, that was most interesting, though, that they did that I think no one else had done at this point, I don't know if still anyone else has done since then, is they actually looked at the last, I think it was 10 years of build out of renewables in this region and said, okay, we're going to assume... Uh, not, we're not just going to assume that that's the rate of build out of new generation going forward. They, they actually doubled it. They're like, okay, let's say that we get really aggressive. We double what's been done in the last 10 years. And then, uh, and then they kind of sketched out what that would look like. And what they found was even doubling that rate of generation build out, that we would not get to a carbon free grid until 2075. And that's with the Lower Snake River dams in place. So full 30 years after the mandates have, have said we're supposed to be there. And, and then if you lost the dams, Lower Snake River dams, it's another five years on top of that, right? And we were able, and it was a really well done study. Um, and it got a, lot of, uh, got a lot of attention in the region. And, um, and I think it really helped shift the way that policymakers thought about things. I don't think people knew how far behind we are on, uh, on getting to these objectives. And so um, I, think that, I think that helped shape opinions. And ultimately, um, um, Senator Murray uh, came out and said, you know, and she said this multiple times now, is that, you know, we just can't afford to get rid of the Lower Snake River dams, yeah. you know, uh, given existing technologies. Um, and that we're a long way away from being able to get to that point. And I think that that was a huge relief, <laughs> you know, because, um, because, you know, again, you know, here's someone who could, you know, has a real say in the future of the dams. And just to have her come out and kind of land what we're, we've been talking about, right? Um, it was, it, but at a very political, you know, the political pressure out there around these issues. And so it was just great to see her stand up for the math. Essentially, I mean, that's really what I would call it. She stood up for the math. And, and it's not always easy to do, you know, um, but, uh, but her recognition there was really important. So to me, we had asked a lot of our members in terms of providing funding for this, for the, this overall effort, which was a campaign and polling and, 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 and studies, and to be able to help be part of a really good outcome um, I felt such a sense of both relief <laughs> um, and, 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 and really like we had done something important. So I think that was probably, to me, the biggest moment because we asked for a lot of faith mm-hmm. from our members um, and, and so many of them rallied behind that effort. Certainly. You know, we're, we're getting down to the end here and as you are, I'm sure, well aware, mm-hmm. we always kind of close out on the whole advice theme. Right. Mm-hmm. But given your previous experience on the podcast, right, 
and also just sort of the the sort of the theme, the the subject, the reason why we're here doing this today. Mm -hmm. I thought instead maybe I could hit you with some more specifically tailored questions oh, yeah. on the note of advice to kind of close things out. Yeah, that sounds great. So the the first one right off the bat, what advice would you give to the next executive director of Northwest River Partners? Uh, I'd say give Austin a raise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, I would say... Um, I would say you have a really great membership mm -hmm. right you know we have around a hundred members um, and engaging them um, is probably the best thing the most important thing you can do and and that is and that looks different for different members right some members might provide financial support for some of the things that you're trying to do other members might be willing to write letters to their Congress people or send newsletters to their customers or mm -hmm. and find out what everyone is willing to do uh, because as a shop of two people plus an analyst back in you know uh, a part-time analyst back in New York uh, who's getting ready to graduate you know from uh, from master from our master's program I mean uh, there's only so much that we can do uh, without our members so we, we 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 I think that we are laser focused on our mission and I think that makes us efficient but it, it it can't you can't do the work that we're trying to do with that small of a group um, and so I would just say you know do everything you can to um, to engage the members and understand what each one is able to do um, and the other thing is, I would say, you know, um, um, I think it's really important to maintain your composure. And I think whoever they hire will will do that. But, mm -hmm. there, you know, sometimes these can be emotional issues. And we've talked about some of the feedback, you know, or energy feedback in some ways, right, right, that, right. That, that, that you can get. And uh, But it's important to remember that even when people are being, like, super emotional, that ultimately they are doing what they think is right. Right. And and if you can give them that grace and um, that's really going to it's going to really be important for the organization. Right. Because you're representing so many different communities and organizations and and they expect you to um, to they expect you to to give that grace, mm -hmm. you know, and to um, and to engage in, in engage in a positive way. And I have done my very best, you know, throughout this five years to always engage in a positive way. And I think that, I think that ultimately that's really important. So next one here, what career advice would you give to a younger version of yourself mm. now that you find yourself in the position that you're currently in? Right. Um, a younger version of myself. Um, I remember younger me. Um, I, you know, I was a lot like me now. Um, the one thing, so I will say this. I've always been a person who loves ideas. I get excited mm -hmm. about ideas. Um, and when I was younger, I would, I would like take those ideas to like my boss or whoever, just with the idea, but not with like the data, mm -hmm. right? Not with any proof of concept. And so resoundingly I would always get shot down uh, because because bosses need data mm -hmm. you know um, they need to they, they don't I mean so few of them I mean there's some uh, there's some people who are like me and think like me and so maybe they'll also get excited but that's you know in general we'll just say that bosses need data right mm -hmm. and so I think I would say the younger version of me be excited but but don't go forward until you have your data. Don't go forward until you have your proof of concept because ultimately um, they won't get excited about the idea until they see the numbers. Yeah. Uh, if it's numbers, right? You know, or yeah. whatever. Like they, they have to see it and then they'll allow themselves to be excited. But they have to see that underlying work first. That absolutely makes sense. Yeah. Uh, what guidance would you give to someone? who wants to make a job change, especially in the case of someone taking on a more advanced role with potentially greater responsibility? 
Um, I would say, um, first of all, I'd say believe in yourself. Um, I, I, um, I think that, I think that um, you may be a person who ha is surrounded by people who are very encouraging. Maybe you're a person who's surrounded by people who are not as encouraging. I think you have to believe in yourself. Uh, but, uh, but that being said, um, I also would say that, um, that you, that you, it's really good to have a trusted set of colleagues, uh, or friends who you can plug into. And, and we had a discussion about this before. Uh, sometimes it's really hard to do an impartial review of yourself, right? You know, right, right. it's like, you know, it's like you're so invested that it, you can't see clearly. Yeah. And so it's really important to have some people that you trust that you can, you know, because you can't, you know, and some, some, some people could be in situations where like most of the people who they work with, they couldn't quite trust to share that, hey, I'm thinking about doing something else, right? Um, so I think that you, but I do really think that having some people who are trusted advisors, and you don't have to take their advice, but people you can have that exchange with who you know are, you know, are, um, are looking out for you. Um, I think that, uh, and say, hey, you know, do you think this is the right time for me? Do you think this is the right opportunity for me? You know, I think that having that trusted network where you could talk to three or four or five people, um, I think that that, um, I think that is going to be really important. And, and so that's, I think that's the very first thing I would say is like, yeah, just have people you can reach out to. And I did before I applied for the mm -hmm. job upstairs. Um, I talked to several trusted colleagues and just like, what do you think? You know, because again, I was just too close to it. Yeah. And uh, I had my instincts. All right, I had my gut, or what, right, right, but I was like, I don't know, I have to really, I have to, I, I need some people I can talk to, and uh, and I, you'll get different advice, right? But just the process of going through that, um, I think it's super, I think it's super helpful. And then once you get in that new job, use your network, right? You know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> don't, and I think this is something young, well, I don't know if young people can do, I think this is something that a lot of less experienced people do, and maybe even more experienced people, is they try to rely too much on themselves. It's like, okay, I got here, and so now I've got to do this, right? And I think that, I think continually being humble uh, and ready to learn, uh, right? I think that that's, and then, and willing to ask for feedback, input, help, right? That's not a sign of weakness. That is a sign of maturity. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And so, um, you know, and you, you know, uh, you'll do so much better and then you'll feel less lonely. Like it's scary <laughs> when, if you only have you to solve every problem, you'll freak out, you know, you'll get scared and, and, uh, it won't be, it, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll have a shorter career in that space than you want to. So, yeah, I think that just, um, being willing to give yourself grace. So I was talking about giving grace earlier. Mm -hmm. Give yourself grace and don't think that you have to do it on your own. So being in the position that you're in, mm -hmm. already being in a high level role, going mm -hmm. to another mm -hmm. high level role, mm -hmm. it's no secret that in those more advanced positions, the interview processes are maybe a bit more strenuous yes. than say, you know, going for your entry level job or, you know, maybe making a lateral move. Right, right. How do you nail a lengthy interview process? <laughs> Chocolate. Uh, <laughs> th th actually, th this is true. So for my interview for upstairs, um, I, um, it was a two hour interview follow uh, and then uh, like a 30 minute lunch, but with the people you're interviewing with. So I still think that counts as part of the interview. Sure. And then another two hour interview after lunch. So it's like a four and a half hour interview. And I'm sure people have gone through worse, but like, you know, that's a long time to be on, right? I mean, let's face it, if you're in an interview, you really need to, you need to be at your very best, like all, you know, all five hours. Yeah. And so I realized after my first two hours, I'm like, I am fading. Like I was doing well, I had adrenaline, right? But after that, it's like, I'm starting to fade. But I had brought two chocolate bars in case of an emergency. And I, um, and I, uh, and so I use both of them. I, I'm like, I'm pulling, 
pulling the plug. I'm breaking the glass, you know. <laughs> and I ate both of them, and it did. It gave me that boost uh, to get through the afternoon. But no, I mean that. So it's funny. Uh, but I think that I would say for those those beginners, you I you really have to prepare. I mean, you have to prepare, prepare. You know, um, they're expecting someone who understands the vision of the organization, who has done their research on the organization, who has has his or her own vision of where they might go with the organization, has great examples of where they've been successful in areas where that organization has needs. Um, I think that I think that you have to you have to do all those things. And then the other thing you have to do, though, is you have to take a deep breath, right? Um, you have to be um, like you have to be in a space where um, where you're focused on you know your excitement for the role, not on how am I doing or you know blah 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 or you know it's like uh, for me that's a secret that's actually the secret to me for public speaking mm-hmm. right um, is I got a, I got really good advice from. A former um, colleague uh, named Kristen Stathis, uh, who uh, used to work at Portland General Electric, is is an officer there, and and I think is doing consulting work now. But she's like, I want to be in service to my message, right? And and unpacking that, what I and I never asked her what she meant, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I think she really meant was she focuses on the message. She's not focusing on herself when she's public speaking and that's what I really try to do I try not to I try not to I try not to think about me and it's it, I've, I've spoken so many times publicly I think I've gotten decent at it right is I'm I'm really delivering the message I care about the message I'm focused on the message right and I'm not focused on how I'm doing mm-hmm. and as soon as you start to think about how you're doing it's all going to really come yeah, yeah, right yeah exactly right it's going <laughs> to uh, exactly it's going <laughs> to unwind um, and so I don't, I think about the message. I think about how important the message is. I think about what I want people to know. And, um, and so I think that's also really important for interviews, um, is, um, is don't be self-conscious, be conscious of the message, right? I want to first acknowledge, um, I mean, all your advice up to now has been great. And that was great advice as well. I'm having a really hard time over here because my, like, I just have this image in my head that you painted of like almost you as this sort of Nintendo character <laughs> and then like the chocolate bars. Oh, yeah. Like, you <laughs> Is that know? Good point? like the power pellet <laughs> exactly, or the, yeah. you know, whatever it would be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I have to share something with you is, um, is, you know, I don't drink coffee, right? Yeah. yeah. And, um, but my wife literally can tell if I ever drink coffee or if I have chocolate. Yeah. And and it annoys her. <laughs> and so, like, if I come in just a little too energized, because I'm a fairly high energy person anyway, but if I come in just a little too energized, she's like, have you been eating chocolate? <laughs> it's like an admonishment. I mean, it's like there's there's right. ju- there's judgment in that voice. <laughs> and, uh, it, no, I, she's a, a tremendous supporter of me, but she is not a tremendous supporter of me on chocolate. Um, but yeah, no, I, um, I do one thing I, uh, I was, I was really involved in athletics in mm-hmm. kind of, in kind of middle school through high school. And I think one thing that athletes do is they do learn, um, they kind of, you learn to connect with your body. Yeah. Right. And, and so like, I knew that like I can monitor that and I like, I, like I said in the interview, I knew I was like. I need a power pellet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so no, it was it was great. I was I was I was really proud. And um, I don't know if Megan Capper ever listens to this podcast, but um, she um, she recommended this really good chocolate to me. That I forget the, if its brand is New or Hue. I always forget. It's like N U or H U. Yeah. But uh, it's like kind of like I think it's like fair trade and really good and. So she turned me on to it so that I brought two of those chocolate bars too. Oh, perfect. Yeah. 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 So thank you, Megan. <laughs> so the chocolate helped you get through the interview. Yes. But finally, the last advice question I have for you. How do you recover from a lengthy interview process? Oh, my gosh. I was so tired. So so that week, so the, the night before, mm-hmm. or the evening before, so when we had our board meeting. So you have to get up for those, right? You have to be prepared for those. Then the next day, we had like the four and a half hour interview. And then the next morning, 
really early, I had a presentation to give up in the Olympic Peninsula, and it was like a three-hour drive. I think you were in my hometown. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I, um, I was, after I got back from that, I slept so long. I was just exhausted. I mean, yeah. you know, I think you can only be up you know, for so long. And, um, and so I think my, my advice, um, you know, for people is give yourself space to know that that's, that it is tiring. It's almost like if you go through anything that's really emotional, I always, you know, I always tell people, give yourself space. Like, don't expect that you can be the same you then, you know, for a little bit, like, you know, and so, it's like don't plan other stuff, you know, right. and get in, and just only plan rest and recovery. That's one thing. I have a 23 year old daughter who I love and adore, and she's a smart she's a smart person. But like she will do things like travel across the you know like you know maybe like travel to Guatemala, then travel back and then you know get get it home at midnight, and she's scheduled to work at like 7 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, I'm like. Come on, you know, come on. <laughs> it's like, that's, you know, like in what world, you know, do you think you're actually going to be able to function, you know, like yeah, that? Yeah. And they know that's like a 23 year old thing to do. Like, I mm -hmm. get that. But, uh, but 53 year old me looks at that and it's like, come on, you know. Yeah. I've never, I've never even come close to that, but there have been a few times where I'm like, my, my physical form is here, but my, <laughs> my mental form is not present at all. Like Absolutely. I'm just, I'm a warm body sitting in that chair. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think that that one, especially, I, I really appreciate that one. Cause like, I know, you know, you've shared in the past that uh, for example, doing yoga has right. been really helpful yeah. for managing stress and yes. doing things. But uh, being able to say like, I'm too tired for even that. And this time is for me, right. you know, I think that sometimes people really struggle with mm -hmm. thinking that they still have to do mm -hmm. maybe whatever their version of going and doing yoga is yeah. when they've, you know, already worn themselves down so far. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's what, uh, so um, I will, I'm going to interject my own advice. I mean, like, you know, you didn't ask yeah. me the question, but <laughs> I had been thinking about how I would answer this time. Um, and one of the things I would say to people, my advice is this, um, just kind of general advice. Um, Mental health is real, and it's important. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I I have in my my family, um, uh, you know, I, I haven't really shared this really publicly with, with folks before, but my mom died by suicide. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was eighteen, and um, and she was a delightful, delightful person. Yeah. But she struggled with depression um, for probably almost all of her adult life. And, um, and so, you know, then when you get into these stressful situations, you can really, uh, and this job has been stressful, right? Um, and if it's prolonged for too long, uh, you can get in a bad place, right? And so I think that, you know, my advice to people is, you know, to really do care for yourself, right? And, um, and to, you know, um, to take time to recover, to take your vacations when you can, to spend time with, you know, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal which said basically the, uh, the three secrets to happiness are going into nature, talking with friends, and, um, um, and going for like walks. Mm -hmm. So ideally, take a you know you can nail all three at the same time right it's just like right, okay right. i'm going for a walk on a hike with a friend who i'm going to talk with right but i think those kinds of things and you know austin i have I'll have so much respect for you i think that um you know you have so much wisdom beyond your years and i think that you are really good at um at kind of self-appraising appraising self-appraising self-appraising <laughs> and uh, I, anyway, you know what I mean, but uh, self-assessing, we'll go with that. Uh, you're so good at self-assessing and, um, and I think trying to do things that are, you know, taking care of your body, taking care of your mind. And, um, and I think that that's something that in this last year that I failed to do, right? Um, I think that with, 
with some of the things that we were working on that I, um, I didn't take care of myself. And I think that it's just so important to, you know, for people to do that, to take care of themselves. And, um, and so anyway, I think that, you know, from my perspective, um, that's the biggest advice I'd give people. I mean, all these other things matter and, and they do matter. Like, you know, our, our work matters, Yeah. but it's not more important than your mental health and the health of your loved ones and, you know, and things like that. So I think that's, you know, and that's advice I need to follow myself. Like, you know, I, I mentioned I'm good at giving advice to people and uh, I'm not as good at giving my own advice to me or maybe listening to me, you know, so, but, um, but I think that, um, I think part of this transition, you know, for my new role, in some ways it's a response to that. It's, 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 it's certainly gonna be a demanding role and, and I plan to give 100% to it, but it's a different kind of, it's a different kind of role, and I think that's going to be good for me. Certainly. And, I, you know, I'm really happy for that, obviously. I mean, I think that it's so important. And I'm also, you know, I really appreciate you sharing that because, you know, people people that listen to this podcast and you know, have listened to any episodes in the past, too, you know, these are, like you said, they're such important issues. But, I mean, you know, ultimately taking care of yourself is, like, where everything starts. Right. You know, if you're not if you're not in a good place mentally and you know you're taking care of your body as well obviously plays a, a huge role in that i mean mm-hmm. the mind and the body you're right. you know totally one and the same uh, you know it's kind of like what what good is the rest of this stuff yeah, right you absolutely, know so. yeah, exactly and without yeah exactly without that and you know we think about uh, one of our dear friends um who is our, our former board chair and i won't i won't name his name but mm-hmm. who went through a, a severe cancer scare and one of the things he you know he really is like he's like don't be like me in terms of like he had gone too long without taking care of things you know right right and um and of course he's had a miracle you know literally you know i mean his the prognosis was so much different than where he is right now and it's just amazing and such a blessing but uh but yeah i think that i think that we we have to go back to taking you know taking care physically mentally it's all connected that's the, that's the other thing yeah. right it's not like we think separately taking care of our bodies or taking care of our minds right and it, your body is part of your mind yeah. you know and your mind is part of your body right it's all it's all the same so yeah i think that that's really important and um yeah so that's i think that's my going away advice well i, I really appreciate that you know objectively uh, i think all of your advice is great and also personally, your, you know, your advice in uh, everything from my resume, which, you know, helping me with uh, really storytelling and kind of, you know, building up myself in my resume rather than just making kind of almost like a bullet point list of mm-hmm. what I've, you know, what tasks I've had or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, helped me so much in getting to where I am. Obviously, you know, it led to you hiring me, right? right? So that worked out all right. Um, but you know, I've been incredibly grateful for that and, and grateful for all the advice and mentorship over the last mm-hmm. few years here. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, thank you for that. Um, uh, thank you for getting to spread some of that today with everyone else that's going to get to listen. You know, they haven't had the privilege of four and a half years, but they've had, you know, basically three episodes now of getting to have some of that. So that's amazing. And, um, you know, I wish you good luck in the new role, and I hope that uh, the view upstairs is really good. And every now and then you come on down to visit. Absolutely, there will be chocolate fish here, so you'll <laughs> you'll have to come down and get more of those. the chocolate fish. <laughs> so I, you know, I do want to. I, I'm I definitely don't want to end the podcast without uh, saying to you uh, what a uh, important place you have in um, you know, kind of in, in my life, you know, um, and it's like I said, it's just impossible to work with someone as closely as we work together and uh and you just w- without developing you know a, a special kinship and uh, and you're amazing um and uh and again for those who don't know austin he's such a he's just such a great thoughtful person like you know what i mean uh and the other thing that's really great about austin and there's a lot of things but the other thing that's really great about austin is like, you know, he's willing to offer super thoughtful input, 
But if he doesn't know, I'll just say, I don't know. You know, <laughs> and, and that's a, I think that's actually a great lesson, right? You know, I, when I was your age, um, I sometimes had really thoughtful advice, but I always felt like I had to, if someone asked me, I had to come up with something. Right. And I think that I think that you're really good at it. It's like when you have something thoughtful, you offer it. And if if you don't, then you're just like, I don't know. <laughs> and, and I think that that's really great, too. But anyway, you're a tremendous partner. You're a tremendous asset to Northwest River Partners. And um, and I'm just I'm I'm uh, I'm really grateful that you're here for this organization. And uh, I, I know that you have just uh, in every aspect, you have such a bright future ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you. And I. I have such a crippling case of like imposter syndrome, right? That like I hear compliments like that, and I'm like, that's I that's just can't possibly be me. But <laughs> it's hard I to take. It's it hard so to much. take a compliment, it is, isn't it? Is, it? Yeah. It's really I think, hard to I take. Think a everyone compliment. struggles with that. Yeah. yeah it's always, my my gut is always like, oh, like yeah. deflect, deflect. Right, right, right. No, don't ex- don't accept this <laughs> but, compliment. <laughs> no, I I appreciate that so much. Thank you sincerely. And um, you know, uh, speaking on behalf of myself and really i mean all of us in public power especially given you know where you're going uh it's really it's not goodbye it's just see you later right yeah, absolutely see, see, see you soon. around it's yeah. gonna be see you soon absolutely and yeah. uh as uh as we talked about before i'll probably accidentally come in here all the time <laughs> <laughs> i look forward to it okay, great well thank you austin thank you for having me hey thanks for sticking around until the end of this one I know we definitely ran a little longer than usual, but this was such a great conversation that I couldn't imagine cutting out really any part of it. I will, however, let this one speak for itself and not add my take here at the end like usual. I do want to address one thing quickly, though. Uh, I never technically said who spilled what on the carpet in our office, and I won't go throwing stones in this glass house anytime soon, as... There was this one instance where I accidentally launched my chicken, vegetables, and rice all over my chair and the area around my desk. And then there was this other time that I dropped a bowl of Japanese curry in front of the microwave, and I promise you uh, these were all thoroughly addressed, but nonetheless, these things happen. Anyways, I asked you all to stick around to the end, so thank you to those of you who followed through. We are cooking up some great future episodes of Damn, but as you can imagine, I've got my work cut out for me these next few weeks. Now that alone wouldn't stop us from doing a normal thing, but the holidays are also creeping up quickly, and that means scheduling guests during this time is really a challenge. We're going to do our best to deliver at least one more episode on our regular schedule this month, and then we're going to pump the brakes come December. Now, Rest assured, we will be back in 2024 with the same schedule, the same format, and the same great audio content you've come to know and love. In the meantime, though, you can keep up with us by following NW River Partners on Facebook, Instagram, X, YouTube, and LinkedIn. As always, you can get in direct contact with us at nwriverpartners.org. Just go fill out our contact form with whatever you'd like to share, and we'll happily get in touch. You can also send emails directly to info at nwriverpartners.org. Last but not least, please kindly leave us a five-star review on your favorite listening platform, and don't forget to turn on notifications so you don't miss future episodes which arrive every other Friday. It's now well past time for me to wrap this up, but do me one last favor and go jam out to the Foo Fighters, my hero, after this in honor of Kurt's departure. See ya.